I mean, somebody asked me that years ago as an art student, would you still make art if you knew you were never going to be recognized? You know, you're never going to be in a gallery show. You're never going to, no one's ever going to see your art. And the answer was yes, of course. Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the Who Cares Anyway podcast. My guest on this episode is Phil Franklin. Now, Mr. Franklin, or Phil, if I may be so informal, is really someone who I should have interviewed for the book itself, given that he played in not one, not two, but three different bands that receive at least some coverage, and that would be uh, Carolina, who actually gets three different chapters, Faxed Head, and The Heavenly Ten Stems. What can I say for myself here? Well, because of the way things worked out, I had interviewed multiple members of each of those groups pretty early on in the process, and I was aware of having, oh, a whole lot of material that I was already going to cut. And so if I can make an excuse, it would be that I feared having to cut even more material given that I would probably get some pretty good stuff from Phil Franklin. And so this interview here is in some sense a a make good for the fact that I I did not interview him for the book. But there's also a lot of other stuff that we get into that would have been beyond the scope of the book. And that is because in addition to his time in San Francisco, Phil Franklin has done quite a bit uh, in other places on the East Coast, both before moving out to San Francisco and after uh, eventually moving back. I recently, back in January of this year, had an opportunity to see a couple of those projects of his on one night when Sunburn Hand of the Man and Franklin's Mint played in Durham, North Carolina, and uh, it turned out that on that particular night, the lineups of those two groups were identical. Uh, The other members of Sunburn served as Phil Franklin's backing band during the Franklin's Mint portion, and then he rotated over onto drums. And they took off doing what they do as sunburned uh, toward the second half of the set. What I did not know until sort of doing a a little bit of additional digging, thinking maybe I should have him on as a guest, was that he also did some very interesting stuff before moving out to San Francisco. In particular, a couple of groups or acts with Chris Ballou, who would go on to uh, found the presidents of the United States of America and go on to some pretty unlikely but pretty big pop success in the mid-90s. And so we connect back to that and then his time in San Francisco and what he's done since then with Sunburn and Franklin's Mint and sort of wind our way through all of the above. One little factual correction, at one point we were talking about a Carolina album that was mastered onto a wire spool and I volunteered that uh, that might have been Cell Hill Holler, but no, that's not correct. The album of Carolinas that was mastered onto Wire Spool was Rings on the Awkward Shadow, a double LP. So with that out of the way, we'll go ahead and step aside and get on with the interview with Phil Franklin. And it starts out with some discussion of Chris Ballou, how he got to know him and what those projects were that they worked on together in the late 80s. Yeah, I mean, we met in college at SUNY Purchase. And they had another band called The Sleep Standing that was more like, you know, the only ones or kind of English influenced rock, you know, I don't know if I, or post punk. I don't even know what you call that, those type of bands, Buzz Cox or, you know. Okay. And, um, that was like the college band. And then Chris and I, after college, did the Dukes of Pop. We recorded that out in Seattle. And then we moved to Boston together and we started that band Egg. And a lot of those songs became presidents of the United States songs and stuff. And, uh, but that happened after we both moved away from Boston. I moved to San Francisco. He went back to Seattle. So. Okay. Was it, were, he, were you all like a 
street busking kind of thing was that kind of the idea or that's kind of how it started we used to busk in the subway and on the streets in boston um our first like road trip across the, my first time in san francisco was a road trip in 87 okay. and we we played in san francisco we played in la we played in texas we went to graceland we like we're just driving across the country back to new york and we just started we started playing on the street and just busking for you know money was it just the two of you or were the, was it just guitar and and drums like with brushes it was just yeah, it was guitar, and he had like a, one of those little like pig nose amps, okay. battery powered amps, and then I had a um, little drum set, you know, a little splash cymbal, some percussion instruments, like a pair of bongos and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was kind of very inspired by like, um, what's the band? Those two guys from New York. Uh, they have that record called Flood. Uh, oh, they might be giants. They might be giants. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, it definitely took a lot from you know, or violent femmes, or you know. And, and so that was already a pretty big transition. But I guess thinking in terms of the age, it probably went from like Borscht was probably high school then. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Borscht so was high school. Was high school. And, uh, it's funny because I met a lot of like kids from the New York hardcore scene in college that were still playing hardcore, but I'd sort of moved on from just, you know, playing music like that. I mean, if I look at my like, you know, quote unquote career, like I've jumped from a lot of different genres and, you know, would play in a lot of different types of bands, even in San Francisco playing like faxed head and then playing in, you know, um, the wandering stars which was like you know ah. christian country you know folk slash you know yeah i didn't know you were in i didn't know you were in that i would i would play their shows I, i'm not on any of their records but ah, you know okay. i was i you know i was really i was really into their music and knew john and andrew and i was just got my way in there and so let me play drums for you guys Okay, because I saw him in 2002. It was sort of a reunion show, but they were uh, Andrew was playing drums and singing. So I I had thought that right. was how they. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, what you were saying about all the different kinds of. So you know, I've always just been, you know, I don't have like a set thing that I do. You know, like I just play loud and hard, fast drums or something. You know, I played percussion for the Secret Chiefs. You know, I played in Heavenly Ten Stent. Like, there's all these bands I've played in that, you know, they sound different. You wouldn't be like, oh, that's that guy who plays drums and, you know. And as I, as I, um, I guess I knew somehow vaguely, but I didn't, you know, when I, when I saw the show a few months ago, uh, you didn't play guitar and sing and write songs. So not just drums either. Uh, yeah, that, well, that sort of happened when I moved back to New York finally and or the East Coast after San Francisco. So around 98, um, I left San Francisco in 97. Okay. And I sort of met the Sunburn guys again in Boston and I started writing, you know, my own songs and they would back me up and we would just play Dylan covers and, you know, Neil Young, we just play other people's songs are my songs sunburns you know was just getting kind of started they'd already had started but they were sort of picking up steam and a lot of stuff happened in that time the early 2000s for sunburn that you know is still you know paying off in dividends as far as getting to tour and make records and yeah, and I, I would definitely want to bring it back to that. I, I was reminded. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That's when I, when, uh, well, I was talking when I was talking to when I talked to Trey or I interviewed him a few months ago. It was just after I think it was either three days or ten days after I had seen y'all because I saw y'all on a Friday and I talked to him on a Monday. But we were uh, I was mentioning to him just seeing the show and I was kind of thinking, you know, I didn't realize he had done this and this other thing as well. 
And but anyway, we kind of decided that you are new weird America <laughs> in, a <sense> of, <laughs> in a sense of encompassing the whole like range of from Carolina, you know, who else has done, you know, West Coast, East Coast, Carolina uh, to to, uh, you know, to sunburned and, and all all of that stuff. But maybe to bring it back to San Francisco. Yeah. What what led you out there? Was it uh, personal connections or was it just a sense of the city? Well, you know, when I first, um, people would always tell me about San Francisco and what a great city it is, but they would say, oh, it's really expensive. People that had grown up there and, you know, when I was going to college and it was on the East Coast, what got me out there was my friend, Eric Mark Cohen, who I went to SUNY Purchase with. Um, he was a drummer for Carolina. Right. And I'd gone out to visit him and our uh, my ex-girlfriend, Kathy Fitzhugh and James Good. They all lived in a house okay. together. And I think I went to go see Carolina for the first time at the Chameleon, which was called the Chatterbox. Was that the called okay. the Chatterbox back then? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it, it, it had a different name. Okay. And that was that was the first time I saw those Carolina. I don't know if I met them or met anybody but i used to print shirts for carolina in boston uh, and i just was like pen pals with grux and we just send packages he would send me records and then eric told me he was leaving san francisco and carolina needed a drummer and i wrote uh, grux and said you know i'd love to come out there and play drums for you and he's like, well, we got a room available for $150 a month, this little sewing room <laughs> in their uh, Victorian on Scott Street. Right, okay. And he's like, and we need a drummer. So I packed up and moved out there. Wow, okay. So that makes but, sense because you 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 also took Eric's place in the Job's Daughter's Heavenly Tinstown sort of continuum there. Uh, right, right. Yeah, he was the drummer for those Job's daughters. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So when, and then when you got out there, then that would have been like the, was Dame Darcy still in it or was it Laura Allen at that point or Laura was in it. Darcy was still in San Francisco, but she was out of the band. She wasn't playing with, with Carolina anymore. Um, Margaret? It's hard for me to, I, I want to say it was 92, but it might've been the end of, 91 might have been the end of 91 i i, I can't really remember it, it's not like those records leave any clues as to what <laughs> era they were recorded in uh you know sonically or otherwise uh and uh but 92 was the year that three three different lps came out by of carolina lps oh really okay i can't, I can't name them off the Cook, top of my head but cooking you, stove beach cooking it, stove beast is eric Strike him hard and drag him to church. I might be on. <laughs> that might be the one because I, you know, all, um, you know, playing drums for Carolina, you know, making your own costumes was all part of you know, the, uh, you know, all came encompassed being in the band. I also brought silk screening. You know, they I mean they had silk screen covers before I think, but. I had a whole t-shirt and silk screen set up at the oh, house. Yeah. So we started doing record covers and our own shirts and stuff. And I mean, Grux was, was always doing that stuff anyway, before I came along, but we really could do a, lo a lot more. Um, and there was a single I put out on the label I had at the time, La Brea, okay. which was, I think was, I think it was the first Carolina single with like these two kids walking in the snow and has like this cloth glued on the back. Is that the one with the yellow cover? The yellow? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So that was something I think I asked to put that out. I think it was right before we did a tour, a, a U.S. tour. So that tour might've been 94, 93. Yeah, that was, you know, I, I wasn't aware of the, any of the, I was still in high school at that point. So I didn't, I mean, I saw a version of Carolina in Chapel Hill in 98, but I, it was long, you know, that was a totally different incarnation. 
of the group. Um, I mean, that's where I was in college. And so there was, uh, there were some people who were definitely fans around the radio station, like a few, uh, who, uh-huh. kind of, uh, who had, who were familiar with earlier, but it's not like if you were outside of, well, you, you wouldn't know you, nobody knew who was in the band really at that point. Right. So it's not, <laughs> it was still, uh, still kind of a guarded secret. I mean, yeah, I feel like, you know, the statute of limitations is maybe up or, uh, you know, I, I did kind of wrestle with that early on in the writing process. And uh, I mean, I still don't go through and say, but partly because I don't necessarily know, but even if I did, I wouldn't say, you know, this person, this person, this person. But it still is quoting. It's, it's all out there. All I mean, I was, there. I was thinking we were, you know, talking about like the residents and, you know, who was in the residents, but I think that's how people know who the residents are, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. They've I, even, I've they've, never, they've even posted pictures of them. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but that was also, you know, that was always a, a band that I always looked up to and loved that idea of like, you didn't know who at all was in the band. Yeah. I actually got from, I asked some people, you know, who were around in the late seventies and the only people who really knew were people who worked with them in some capacity and others would say like, maybe they knew, but or maybe if you pointed them out to me, they'd recognize them, but they didn't really, they really didn't know. Mm. Whereas with Carolina, it, it seemed like it was a little more of an open secret if you knew people. But if you were somebody like me on the other side of the country, and you, you know, it, it would be, you wouldn't have any idea. And <laughs> the names wouldn't necessarily mean a whole lot anyway, unless you were really include into a lot of other bands. Right, right. Unless, you but, know, you're following. <laughs> right, if you're following all this this other stuff. But... Yeah, I'm just trying to think as a drummer um, or a musician in general, like the the idea of, because well, at one point in the book, I made an analogy that's maybe not very original, but thinking of, you know, Carolina as being like an, an alternate world kind of musical academy in the same way that Miles Davis, I mean, Sun Ra would probably be a more apt kind of thing, but Miles Davis in the sense that you would have all of these people passing through often on their way to doing other stuff. It's just that wasn't in, in the jazz world. But on the other hand, you know, the kind of musicianship involved in Carolina is a, is a, just a different kind of thing. But what, what was it that as a drummer that will that led you to want to play like, kind of knowing what might be involved and as far as like playing with bulky costumes on and all that kind of stuff. I guess, you know, when I used to listen to it before I was in the band, before I really knew what it was about, um, you know, you, you can't really make heads or tails of a lot of it after just a, even a couple of listens. It really takes a while to get into it and to hear the parts and decipher the lyrics. And But being in the band, you know, I guess it's a little bit, you'd always hear about Captain Beefheart with these like regiments and like, you know, everyone's eating you know, peanut butter and oats for a week and they're locked in this attic room. I mean, there was a little of that sort of idea, you know, being in that band, but it wasn't, you weren't chained to your instruments. Or, you know, the doors were locked, but, um, you know, uh, I, I like, I always like the, um, you know, being in all these different types of bands and learning the, the songs, I was like the challenge of parts. And even if somebody else did the drum parts and like, oh, we want you to play this reunion show. Here, here's what you're going to play. Of listening to a, a drummer and learning what those parts are for a song or for a live show, even a one-off type of situation. So another band would be like the Secret Chiefs Three, where I didn't write those parts. I'm not on the records, but I toured with them for a few times and did my, you know, best to learn William Wynott's percussion parts. You know, and I I knew I knew Willie. He kind of got me that gig, and 
you know, there's a lot of things that are on those records that I, I can't do, you know, and they would either simplify it or there was stuff that was sampled, certain percussion parts, you know, and then, like the, um, and then we were working with Danny Heifetz, who I still work with now in Australia. He's yeah. out here. And yeah, it's, there are things like that for Carolina that, you know, Grux would have a vague idea of what he wanted and he would just, you know, just make, you know, do like that, you know, fast drum roll and then go into a car's beat and then, you know, do the, you know, there was a lot of pop elements that I think a lot of people wouldn't know that Carolina, that he would, you know, pick and choose of other, you know, mainstream music. You know, I mean, I just remember there was like a Cars thing. Do a Cars, you know, Rick Ocasek <laughs> or whatever the drummer, you know, the, he wasn't the drummer, of course, right, but, right. you know, some riff and just, just fuck it up. And, but uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, it's a lot of very, um, if you saw it laid out, you know, the ideas of, if you could write out the drum parts for Carolina and the violin parts, the banjo parts, anybody could play it. You know, it doesn't really, it, it almost had that sort of, I mean, I can't play a Miles Davis song, but you know, or Sun Ra um, part, but it, if you were accomplished, you could play that, that music, I guess. I get, but then maybe, Maybe the question is, uh, I don't know, if somebody were a more uh, accomplished, maybe, maybe not more accomplished, but if they were a, a chops-oriented drummer, would they have to unlearn things to play that kind of music, or would they have to check their check their ego or check their? Yeah, you'd have to. Their... I mean, if 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 you said all I do is like this, these blast beats, you couldn't be in the band. You had to be open to, yeah unlearning or playing it in a fucked up way, you know, I guess, you know, if you had to be like, okay, don't use drumsticks here. Just use these, you know, weird sticks or something. Don't use brushes or, um, I guess you didn't, you know, being accomplished could also just mean just being open to any of the possibilities of how yeah, that, you play, how you how you play music I mean, being yeah, accomplished that, that's a loaded term i didn't i guess accomplished yeah, as soon I, as no, i said it it came out that I, I was like well I, I i said it i think before you and i thought oh well, did you I yeah don't know if you did. Not, maybe i said it. well i was just thinking because <laughs> of of uh certain it, it, it would apply to different instruments as well i mean i grew up my, my instrument was guitar and so there would be the guitar magazines where yeah, they would feature other players, but the cover, say in the late eighties, late eighties, or when I'm picking up guitar, you know, that's the Steve Vai, Joe Satriani era, and that and those are kind of the ones with, with all the product endorsements and all that. And I imagine if someone's picking up the drums in in the in the eighties, I don't know who the who the uh, equivalent drummers would be, but there is that kind of orientation, and then. The motivation to, to play with a Carolina would be almost a 180 of that. Yeah, maybe. I maybe. Mean, <laughs> it's just, you know, those type of, like, I grew up listening to say, you know, um, ah, what's his name? Well, Neil Pert Her, of Rush right. and the guy from the police, uh, Copeland. I mean, uh, yeah. St Steve Stuart Copeland? Copeland? Stuart, Stuart, Copeland, Stuart. Yeah. You know, those type of drummers where, like, I just remember they're like, cassettes of myself when i was like 14 playing you know some police song and singing along and doing the drums or you know, 15 and like those drummers you know just ridiculous to me like especially neil pert with all his you know his percussion instruments and just like parts you need a th 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 thesaurus to you know understand the lyrics and stuff <laughs> but uh you know those type of bands yeah, Carolina was totally not like any of those bands. Or, or, yeah. Was it, um, 
I don't know. Was it at all confining in a way, like to like in a narrow kind of like they're only going to do this kind of stuff, or did you feel like as a drummer was it? Uh, I don't really really know where I'm going with this, but uh, I, I would sometimes just wonder about like for anyone playing in Carolina, you're they would have to basically almost like surrender part of their personality to to this entity that's this that's this anonymous entity, and with that you know really more so than in i mean maybe maybe not more so than other bands i'm not sure but like it seems to me that that there's a lot of surrendering of 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 kind of at least on the surface level like individual in like individuality for this this collective thing but maybe there was more room for for like individuality than than there seemed from the outside well like you said, you could never tell who was in the band right. seeing the show. You know, no one's like, and that was a big part of like Grux's thing, like not to have this big ego and stuff. And it was sort of, it was his band. I mean, let's be honest, you know, Carolina is the singing bull. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the whole story behind it, you know, finding these books of lyrics and that there was a singing bull. And now we're just, this band is just doing his songs from the 1800s. So yeah. it's already like removed from, you know, we're, it's not even his band, you know? Right. We're just, we're in service to the, to the music. And that's really what we were, you know, we were, he would come up with some parts. He said, this is my idea for this song. My biggest, you know, regret is that, and again, this was part of the, the process and the beauty of Carolina was that it wasn't recorded in a proper studio and it, things were more defined and clear, you know, if you, if you wanted that, you know, there was, a, I was thinking about this one record that was, that was mixed onto wire spool. I forget mm. which record it was. And, you know, I just remember it, it sound, it sounds horrible, but wire spool, would sound horrible if you recorded a band on them. any Sel band on this. Sell Heel Holler. I think that's. Is that what it is? Oh, it's like a bird. It's like a bird on. I think that's it, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I mean, again, the, even after. I mean, there's a cliff. There's a cliff notes document that you might be familiar with that that you know Brandon prepared and and shared about where things were recorded and like some of them were recorded at Brandon's place in uh, the inner Richmond. And then some okay. of it was recorded at Greg Freeman's studio, but right. where, is gonna, that were mostly where you were recording? No, so I had never been there with Carolina, but yeah, low down. I was I well, it's a funny story, and maybe you've heard this from Brandon or somebody. But you know, after we had all left the band, we went to low down and tried to record our own Carolina record uh, without Grux. I never heard and, this. And was gonna, all right, now I'm gonna probably, you know, I'm still friends with Grux up to now. Let's see okay. what happens. Okay. I, I mean, the idea, this, this never, it never got finished, it never came out, but we recorded this record. And the idea was with these ex Carolina members, and then was gonna get somebody to sound like Grux, to sing like Grux, and put out this Carolina record, just, just release it out in the wild. And again, this is kind of like, when Grux and, and Plainfield did that Jello <laughs> record, I was gonna say it was like a you know a little taste of his own medicine, and he may have loved it. You know, Grux may be like, "Oh, this is like, you know, if it's yeah. if it sounded good and and and, and it would have been good." I remember some of it was it was recorded. You know, I don't know if it was twenty four track, maybe it was, but it was there was a lot of ideas on that that Brandon had. And uh, I think Laura might have been involved. Maybe she wasn't involved at that point. I don't know. I know there was talk of getting like Greg to sing on it. Uh, Trey might have been part of it. Uh, it was definitely, you know, all the people in that circle trying to finish this record. And if Brandon still has it, you know, it would be amazing if that ever did, could get finished. Um, 
were they were they songs that were in the repertoire already or were they these were like i think we just wrote all these new songs i think it was it was just a, it was going to be this you know 12 song record but recorded really well and that's kind of my biggest regret with carolina all the other you know i mean there are so I, I haven't even listened to a lot of those records in years so i don't even know like Banknotes, Dreams and Signatures, I think that was recorded a little bit better. It's funny, and just to bring this back to my present, you know, I mean, I have my band where I play guitar and write songs, and that's sort of like my great love, you know? That's what I love to do, is just write songs. You know, I don't have any other, you know, ideal of what's going to happen after I write the songs and try and record them the best I can. But a band like Sunburned also like Carolina would just record stuff on MP3 cassette. There's still stuff coming out that was recorded, you know, 2000 in the two thousands, maybe even like the late 1900s when they started and the recordings are pretty dirty sometimes, you know, they don't sound as good as when recently they've been going into real studios with a producer or, or a uh, engineer and recording these song, these records that I think are far superior than this other stuff work, you know, concise songs or more concise ideas and the qualities it's very good now yeah they're on you know three lobe and there's a record coming out in october we just did um we recorded in january oh, okay. and it's got a it's got a lot of vocals it's got a lot of spoken word and poetry and it's it's a great it just sounds so good to me you know when i listen to other sunburn records comparatively if Carolina had something like that, I would love to have just one record that was, you know, quote unquote slick, you know, it would still sound insane. You know, you don't need to have it all muddy and recorded, you know, on wire spool. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's kind of but like, I, those, yeah. But I understand it. it. It makes perfect sense. You know, you know, it's like, yeah, it seems like maybe, maybe, maybe there was some concern. Again, I, I can confess it fear earlier, the wrong word. Maybe not, maybe concern isn't the right word, but the idea of this being slick. And again, it's so far from from that, uh, from from being that. Like, uh, I mean, I, I think you could probably put Carolina in the same studio setting where Steely Dan recorded, and it still wouldn't be slick. Right. I mean, right. it would still, it would, there would still be a lot of, of, uh, it, it wouldn't, or it may be slick isn't the right word. It wouldn't be obvious music. Mm. Well, if you so, talk to, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, if you talk to Brandon again, ask him about this record. Okay. Cause I'd be curious to hear if he still has the tapes, if more was, if vocals were ever added to it, cause we were just doing the music. Okay. That's, and then again, like I said, they're going to get somebody, you know, you know, who knows? It could be a big celebrity name, you know, <laughs> vocalist <laughs> who could do what Grux does, you know, and just have some crazy name. But maybe, you know, that, maybe, maybe they have, could have got Jell Jell out to sing on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the Magic Band, it wasn't a new album, but... Um, with John French, it was like 2003. So I interviewed him because I was briefly writing for a publication where that came up as an opportunity. So I interviewed John French and it was right around the time they they were doing this magic band tour with kind of a reconstituted, like it wasn't a, a, a particular lineup that had ever played together, but uh -huh. members from the magic band. And he came, he did the, the vocals and it sounded amazingly similar to Captain Beefheart. Wow. Like eerily similar. But it was almost like the way he was talking about it, it was almost like some kind of therapy or, or like to be able to do this stuff and come back to it because he, he almost described it as like what you were saying earlier about peanut butter sandwiches and, and, and oatmeal, uh, as, you know, as being, yeah, it was like a really kind of 
uh, not not traumatic, not cult like, but but kind of like talking about it in the same way that one might talk about a, a difficult family situation, growing up under a domineering father, and sort of like having these issues that needing to achieve some kind of closure. Uh, mm. as, as far as like seeing the positives in it, but also feeling like he never got credit for the stuff that he did or that he was doing all this work in service of someone else. And uh, I can only imagine like, yeah, but anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a different, I mean, yeah, it's a different band, a different time. I mean, it, it, I could go back and describe all these, you know, things I remember about Caroline, about, about Grux, about five, three, nine Scott, about, you know, the band on tour, but ultimately it, it was a joy, you know, it was fun. It was really fun. It was great to be a part of that band. And like you said, it was something going through that, you know, coming to San Francisco, being in Carolina for two, three years, I felt like, you know, I could be in any band after that, you know? Um, and I, like I said, I was playing in all these other bands at the time, doing other musical projects and stuff. So even though Carolina might be like, you have to play like this and you have to wear this crazy costume on your back and you have to do all this stuff. I could then go play with, you know, the wandering stars and just play, you know, kind of country, you know, Gene Pitney style drums, you know. Or you could play with Fax Head and wear another crazy costume. Another, yeah, another yeah. box on your head type of band. But did that did that because um, you you replaced a different drummer in that? But how soon after uh, you got out there did you end up in the Fax Head? Not too well, long I, after. I just found a photograph. I was a roadie before I was the drummer, so there's a photograph of them playing at the Chameleon, and I think his name was was Scott. Scott, Scott. yeah, Scott, and yeah. he was Washington D.C. head. And it's just me and uh, Brentley Pusser as roadies. Okay. okay. I think he was he was shithead and I was fuckhead or something. I f I forget what my name was as a roadie. But um, it wasn't soon after that first single came out. Um, I think I was a roadie for two or three shows and then I became the drummer. There's a track on a compilation and accredited to Fax Head Roadies. Is that? Is that what it might be, but that I think that's after I think that's when it's I was after. in the band. That might oh, okay. be Harvey, Harvey, Brentley. Uh, okay. Was there another roadie? I don't know. I, but it was I, I think that was the tribute to Hannah Tarash or something. Right. And uh and that connects into the whole Japan angle. And so you did have two two different trips to Japan, right? That would Carolina and then with Fax Ted. Those are my only two trips so two, far. Two trips. Yeah. Um, of the people who went to Japan, uh, Brandon was the only one I was able to talk to. And so he had his, uh, has his view of it. But I mean, the main thing he told me was that it was just um, completely unprecedented for being in Carolina as far as the, the treatment or the, the, the audiences and there was just the overall reception. But do you remember anything that stands out about that? You know, I was trying to remember a lot of it. I, you know, I remember we played Bears, the club in Osaka, Osaka yeah, which is still there. I just, okay. I just saw Aaron Dillaway played there, and I wrote, "Is that the same Bears?" It's like, yeah, it's ah. the same, same club. And that was a small, you know, chameleon-like type club, as I recall. I think we played, opened up for the Boredoms, and that was a big show. I'll be honest with you. I have a, I, I remembered, you know, parts of, you know, taking the bullet train from Tokyo to Osaka, or you know, going to Kyoto to the temples, you know, just as a as a tourist. Yeah, just being put up in Japan just to go there was amazing. And facts, Ted. Also, I, I, you know, I have memories of these shows. I mean, there's that video. Yeah. Like, like three cameras and the way it's edited and you know it's a <laughs> it's it's amazing to me that all that happened you know for those bands um and you know <laughs> it's like 
I wish we were still doing more of that kind of stuff, you know. Well, facts, Ted. And Carolina, I think, has been back to Japan. I think Rex has gone yeah. back there as Rubbero. Oh, okay. I think so. But um, yeah, it was sort of unprecedented that we got to go there and play. And we, we may, I remember making a lot of costumes and you know, traveling on the train with our, you know, guitars and the good thing about japan is a lot of these clubs have drums have amps already there for the band so oh, okay that was um some people described like playing over there whether it was trey with the fax ted or brandon i can't remember exactly but as if like the noise thing over there had already happened and a lot of these people were sort of almost coming out of retirement but it you know from my perspective you know that i was just finding out about that stuff maybe even after and a lot of those i mean like mertz bow is still doing stuff certainly and you know the boredom did that super super r so a lot of that stuff i mean it wasn't dead by any means it seems like to I, me I, but i didn't feel that way i i didn't really know a lot of these bands M masana soul mania which I think Soul Mania just, just played with Aaron in Japan. Okay. Like, yeah, you think of like, oh, these, these noise guys, are they still doing stuff? <laughs> I, I guess they are, you know? I mean, there are other, um, I'd love to go back, you know, and being in Australia right now, I'm like, I gotta find a way to go back to Japan because it's, I'm so close. Um, but, is, I mean, Sunburn would be the closest band that I could maybe go back with. And Sunburn, I think, would be, if they could arrange a tour there, it would be, um, I think it would be, um, they'd be welcomed, you know, by audiences there, hearing them. But at that time, yeah, it was just, it was just a big adventure to go, to go there and get to play and get to get to stay there for a while it yeah. seemed like there was a, definitely a lot of mutual uh, appreciation well i don't know about a lot but a, a certain amount between uh japan overseas label and banana fish you know things in san francisco covering or releasing or distributing japanese stuff and the japanese label at least putting out some san francisco stuff and there was a quote that I found in uh, this uh, zine called Browbeat that had an interview with uh, I from the Boredoms. And I quoted it at the top of the Carolina in Japan chapter. But he basically is, said that, you know, San Francisco is more, more, more crazier or something like that is, is basically he, he looked and what he's seeing, what he knows of, you know, Carolina, Faxed Head and whatever else. He he sees that as San Francisco from right. Japan and sees that and thinks, wow, what is this place like? And people in San Francisco or in the U.S. would could look at Japan and say, boredoms, uh, Masana, Mertzbau, and you know, all this stuff. Yeah, That's the craziest I mean, place in the world. But then it's in both places, it's a very, very, very tiny sliver of the population that's going to be interested in these things. But yeah, I mean, both those musical communities yeah it's extreme right it's like taking it to the extreme and i you know you mentioned new weird america and how like you know that wire cover about massachusetts mostly and that kind of free folk new weird america you know it, it again it's like you know it's somebody writing about it and coming up with a term like that and it just sort of sticks and it's 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 interesting to be associated with something like that i mean i never really thought about this when i was in san francisco and playing with these bands you know it was it was just making music and people that became friends and getting to play getting to tour getting to play you know music in other places but yeah, Japan always seemed like this, the more insane, crazy culture to me, being on the outside. But I'm sure if I grew up in Japan, we're in all these bands, you know, 
she could be like, oh, you know, I got to get into the boredoms. Like, that's like my dream. Like, if I was Japanese, maybe right. but came from a different culture. And, but yeah, those it, those bands, I, I don't really, I still don't follow a lot of, you know, what, go, what happens nowadays in Japan or San Francisco. And San Francisco, I guess, has changed tremendously. Oh, I'm yeah. sure I'm sure Japan has too, but the fact that like bears is still there, you know, I mean, the chameleon I think is now, uh, I, I don't even know. It, it turned into the elbow room. No, no, it, not, that's not true. It turned into it had, amnesia. Sorry. Amnesia. Elbow, yeah. Amnesia. Elbow room. I think it was a different spa space. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. Amnesia. I don't know if that's, if it, that's what it still is. And, like, I can't hold I'd say I can't remember, but I don't, that's not fair. I haven't, yeah. I mean, <laughs> last time I was in San Francisco was about nine years ago. So it changed. Yeah. I, apart from last week, it was 2016 and it was a big, it was right. already a big change. I mean, you'd see so one place that's like that place. It's exactly what I remembered. And then next door might be completely <laughs> different oh, or, um, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, it's, that's a whole nother another story but oh so back on the, the yeah. new weird america um i guess well before i forget then i'll backtrack to another question but when that came out like did you feel like because if, if i look back at say um like san francisco of the or of the 90s and that kind of period I, I there's still i wouldn't even attempt to give it a label but it's almost like retrospectively or retroactively that was almost pre new weird America. And, you know, you could throw in, say, Sun City Girls and um, True. Or things that were happening in the 80s and 90s, but but there wasn't a name for it then. And, and then only when this new weird America comes in, it's not the exact same thing. But when I saw you all play a few months ago, it kind of hit me that and when you did a Sun City Girl song and, you know, just kind of the way that you all approach playing and the, the looseness of it or the uh, allowing for certain things to kind of, you know, mistakes or, or wrong notes to kind of be part of the process, or maybe they weren't wrong, but like, you know, <laughs> it, but it's definitely not like, uh, it, it's just a different way of, of, inter, of musicians interacting than, um, somebody who, you know, somebody grew up practicing, you know, recording in, in Cubase and Pro Tools with a click track, or just, it's a totally different way of like a group in, even if it's not totally improvisational, even the songs that y'all are playing are played with a certain kind of looseness. And I was thinking, well, the, the last thing I can really remember seeing that felt that way was Sun City Girls. And then I'm kind of stepping back and seeing, well, all of this stuff, you can kind of see it as a continuum, but mm. 2002 or 2003, whenever the New Weird America thing comes out, um, I don't know where I'm going with this. I don't know if it felt like is it really new or does it felt like I'm just doing the kind of thing I was already doing all along and they're just giving it a new name? Well, it's funny you bring up the Sun City Girls because I met Alan and Rick and Charlie, you know, through Grux, Grux playing me their records and back in 94, 95, you know, and we'd go up to Seattle and play with them. They'd come to San Francisco. They'd play with Carolina, you know, and everyone sort of knew each other. Trey knew those guys, Brandon, you know, and then coming back to the East Coast and playing with Sunburned, they on their own sort of made contact with them. And we had a few shows with the Sun City Girls in Boston on the East Coast. Um, I, th I don't know if we ever played their place in Seattle, but we played... You know, I, I, I now I can't really remember if we played with the Sun City Girls proper or do maybe just Alan, Alvarius B. Um, I know. They were the master musicians of blank that were also yeah. going, that were kind of in the same. Yeah, and the Diminished Men, we met the, those guys. Um, but it was funny just to have them as sort of this anchor between those two bands. Because I remember when I first joined Sunburn proper, I wrote to Greg Turkington. I said, 
you know that band Colonel Truth, the Berkeley Street Gurus? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I joined them, the East Coast version, <laughs> for real. And, uh, you know, at, at, back then they were very much like barefoot hippies and dogs playing bongos in the dirt type of band, you know, but great, you know, and but I had so much more than that. But yeah, New Weird America, I, I guess I, I like that term. I don't have any, I don't have a problem with it. I, I don't really know what it means. You know, it's, I guess, musically bands that fall out of the, the, the proper way that you play music. <laughs> There's a lot of bands in New Weird America then, you know. I guess the main difference between the way that was at least characterized and something like a Carolina, for example, would be that there was more of a, dare I say, like hippie-ish framing of the New Weird America. It was kind of like hip, taking some elements of psychedelic era, hippie era music, but ex explicitly not being jam bands in the in the jam band circuit sense so but but also like being experimental but also there was a certain kind of looseness to it that was uh mm -hmm. that but but still i mean even sun city girls like when i taught when i interviewed alan bishop for for this thing uh you know i asked him what what how they perceived san francisco back in in the days and he was saying that you know that it it represented you know not just what was going on at the time with you know whether it was maximum rock and roll but you know search and destroy research but also beats which they were interested in and the, the hippie era and he said that you know a lot of their friends in san francisco weren't interested in that stuff but he, right. he saw all of it and if you listen to them and you know torch of the mystics it's kind of like one foot in psychedelic hippie stuff but it's still coming out of this after punk post-punk kind of thing so it's it's kind of walking a i'm like kind of walking a tightrope between like not just being cheesy like uh hacky sack uh, drum circle hippie music but on the other hand it's taking some stuff from that i don't know i don't know yeah well you know but kind of like how i was thinking how i mentioned before it's yeah there was like this 50s jazz and beats thing and writing 50s early 60s and then the whole hippie you know hate ashbury scene whether you like it or hate it a lot of those bands, like growing up, the first Jefferson Airplane record I heard was after bathing at Baxter's. And that record is off the wall. That's, that's a bonkers record. You know, whether you're into punk or, you know, 60s music or jazz, you listen to that record and that's like a true, amazing psychedelic record. And I don't know if you know that record, but that was like the first, taste of san francisco i had being i don't know 12 years old 13 years old hearing that my father had all these you know columbia house records that he must have gotten you know like <laughs> and it's funny i just wrote a story about this i'll send it to you about um you know columbia house records 10 cds for a penny oh yeah. he must have done, he must have did this with records in the 70s because he had like jethro tull benefit he had Rolling Stones flowers, and he had this after bathing at Baxter's record. And my father was not into any of this type of music. He was into opera. So I don't know what they were doing on our record shelf, but I would just sit with headphones on and listen to these records, you know, before I played even before I even played music, before I played drums, or right around the time I started playing drums, which were around 12 or 13 years old. But yeah, San Francisco, it has that draw. It has this weird, there's something in the water, there's something, you know, in the land that probably if you went back to the Native Americans, the music that was happening on that piece of land, there's something there, you know, there's undeniably something under the ground, in the air, in the water, I don't know. And, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, that's kind of my favorite time, you know, of making music, being in a city, and just living life with San Francisco from 92 to 97, those five years, six years. 
was was there anything particular that that led you away from San Francisco well, before the sun burned was it was there any uh thing that drew you back there or was it just getting out of San Francisco well yeah I was getting out of San Francisco um I mean you know I'm from the east coast yeah I was just coming back you know I didn't really have a definite reason um you know uh i definitely got into some bad habits coming back you know which threw a wrench into a lot of music making activity you know aka drugs but um other than that you know that was a that was a detour a big detour which I'm happy to say I have left behind finally. There's there's a song about that on the Franklin's Mint CD. Maybe. Yeah, there's that that last Franklin Mint record, Temporary, is a lot about becoming sober and you know uh not drinking anymore, not you know, not not getting involved in that lifestyle. But yeah, for a long time the East Coast had that draw on me, you know. I mean you know, there's heroin in 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 San Francisco, but somehow, you know, being in New York City and it's in close to the confines of New York City has always had a pull on me, you know. Um, yeah, it's just my personal history. It's not a sunburn thing. It's not a, a, you know, a band thing or music thing. It's just something that's always been inside of me, you know. And yeah, getting sober, being welcomed again in the sunburn camp, because for a long time I wouldn't tour, I wouldn't play with them, you know. You know, I was just a mess. And they stood by me, you know, as friends, as people, and Greg and, you know, Danny and, you know, people from Faxted, you know, just, it's just great to, you know, to be sober and to still be friends of these people after all these years and be able to maybe do future musical projects together so yeah well i mean i've certainly um i talked to a lot of people from the early era of the punk era and um these things were really prevalent and i was maybe naive in thinking that that wasn't something that surfaced later on uh it, it wasn't as prominent at least yeah, I mean, a lot of those bands in San Francisco at that time, nobody really did. It wasn't like hanging around and drinking and doing drugs and like, yeah, let's play some music now. And Sunburn had a little bit more of that. The East Coast had a little bit more of that, you know. Not, not you know, not hard drugs per, per se, but just set, you know, <laughs> practices at eight o'clock and we'd show up at practice and we had a case of beer to drink before we actually played music, you know, and like that was still happening, you know, and, you know, whether it added to the music or not, it, that's not really <laughs> relevant. It was, yeah. You know, if you like to drink, you got to drink if you want to get drunk, right? If, if that's what you want. But if you know if you're happy just to play music and get serious, well, then don't bring any beer. Little little tip to the kids out there, you know. Yeah. But um, it's um, it's just something you know. Yeah, San Francisco. There was plenty of bands that were like you know getting high and getting fucked up. But the bands I was associated with, and and my, where my head was at, I was trying to keep away from that and. So I did. As soon as I got back to the East Coast, that all went out the window. So, you know, that has more to do with me and my environment and just whatever, you know, my will. But yeah, I'm sure in, in San Francisco, all those, you know, pre kind of Amarillo, just to put that under an umbrella bands, you know, Grux would tell me stories of living with, uh, uh, Will Shatter. Yeah. I think he lived with them for a while. And, you know, yeah, these crazy stories of, you know, 
drugs and whatever. Yeah, and I don't, I didn't feel like on the one hand I'm not getting into detailed accounts that would glorify it in any way, like the, any kind of poetic portrayal of it. But on the other hand, I'm not moralizing about it because it's kind of like from the quotes from different people, you just kind of see what happened. I mean, you, you know, you just hear what happened and, uh, and it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not going out and uh, scolding people for past decisions because it's kind of like those are the decisions that, or those are part of people's things that they've dealt with, just like everybody else deals with stuff. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's out there, right? You know, like I remember, you know, there are certain things like I've never murdered somebody, but I don't want, I don't want to murder any, like, I, that's not my thing, you know, but <laughs> sticking a needle in my arm, I always wanted to try it. So I did, you know, it's like, it's like, what do you want to do? You know, um, you know, I'm not proud of it, but I don't regret it either. You know, so I'm glad I'm still here to talk about it because there's plenty of people I know who, you know, didn't make it, and, you know. Yeah I, only, yeah, I only picked up on the, from the Franklin's Men album, I gathered that there was some sense of, you know, it's not nostalgic, but there's a, a past feeling about it, but I, the only little bits of it would, would relate overtly to that. I have to listen to it again. Right. Well, I mean, this is sort of in the back of my head. Like that's kind of the first record I wrote after getting clean and stuff. And, a lot of those songs, I think, subconsciously refer to it in some way. I mean, there are certain songs that are very obviously about it. Did you feel like the with Franklin's Mint? I almost hear it as a continuation of the of like Egg and Dukes of Pop kind of era stuff that you were doing. Yeah, in a, in a little way, it's definitely you know more structured. You know, these are like these songs. I you know, and not to like compare myself to Neil Young and Crazy Horse, but that would be like sort of how we go about recording or doing those songs. It's like you learn it just enough and you record it or play it you know whatever happens happens if it if it breaks down in the wrong place you just go with it you know there is still sort of this improvised form within the songs and especially when you saw us play like you know me and that drummer john we've played together for a long long time but the other two guys was the first time playing in franklin's mint and oh. we're not sort of structured song guys per se you know so it, i don't know those especially that show you saw was not very good well in all honesty. It, it was hard to know what to measure it against but i mean they right it was clear right. that nobody in the band was the kind of person who's gonna say i missed this part we must start over like everybody's pretty much rolling with the the yeah. punches are going with the flow as far as you know if you play the wrong note here you just get back on the next chord or try to figure out where the next chord is and and there's that that process of sort of uh when in the say in the 90s i got a chance to see some of the 60s free jazz guys mm. and i don't mean to like make it sound you know it's kind of like that that's a way of playing that people can learn but it's not really that's going to come naturally and i was realized that you know from when you came up playing music you're not that much older than me. I mean, I don't mean to make you sound like old, old, but like that, 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 like the era in which you learn music is, it's, you know, it is, you know, pre digital. And it is, uh, in addition to all the like different experience you have playing different kinds of music, but it, it struck me as like that you all like have something as a group that you don't just pick up by just picking up instruments or, um, learning even like learning you know watching youtube tutorials or something and that kind of thing it was like it's a it's an interplay thing mm. and even yeah, if you well, don't yeah sorry i'll stop there oh, no. <laughs> well i was just thinking like you know coming up in the pre-digital like 
now if I want to learn a song, I will sometimes go to YouTube and you realize like, oh, that's how you play it. Like these songs that used to seem so difficult and these chords. And of course, like you mentioned Steely Dan, like I just learned a Steely Dan song, <laughs> but it doesn't sound like Steely Dan, I'm just playing it on acoustic guitar. <laughs> but you can really learn all these chords and then you can use those chords in one of your own songs. And that's usually what I do. And if I learn a new chord, I'll write two or three songs with that chord in the song <laughs> and then pick the best one that I like. Um, but that's just, you know, Franklin's Mint has always just been about me writing songs and getting these guys to play with me. Now I get Danny and Bear here in Australia. You know, they have their own thing, but we're happy to play with, you know, they're happy to play with me and I'm glad that they do play with me because it's always been better for me to play with people who are better than myself. I mean, that's probably true for a lot of musicians, you know, that it pushes me to try and be better. Because I'm more of a, I think of myself more as a drummer than a guitar player and songwriter, but that's really what I love to do. And, you know, if I could go back, maybe I would just do that from the beginning, but, you know, I picked up I picked up drums because where I grew up, there were six or seven guitar players right. on the street, and they're like, "We need a bass player or a drummer." And I'm like, "Well, I'll be a drummer." <laughs> okay, yeah, I wasn't sure which one you'd picked up first, but I, you yeah. know, from seeing that Borscht video, I knew that you you were playing drums from an early age, at least. Um, yeah, you know, pre hardcore and pre original music, you know, just would we play like get together with the local guitar players who are all older than me and play, you know, Eric Clapton songs, Cream songs, Jimi Hendrix, you know, like just play all the sixties blues oriented rock and roll, you know, uh, jam music, I guess, you know, they just want to play, you know, leads endlessly. Right. <laughs> while a drummer and a bass player would just be in the background. But yeah, that was just sort of my first bands. Um, it's funny, I just contacted somebody from my high school, um, this guy, J Jim Ehrlich, James Ehrlich. And in high school, you know, I was playing in Borscht and I, you know, would play whatever, just in a, song structured songs but there was an early band that i was in called oddba i never put out anything and oddba was just we just you know you either just be under the influence of something or just just playing music just write these weird songs that's kind of pre carolina and sunburned type of, of band and he's going to send me a cdr of some of the songs cuz i haven't heard them in 20 okay. years or something. How do you spell but, it? O, o, like odd o, o D D B A odd ba. Okay. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't, there's nothing on YouTube. There's nothing any, anywhere. You know? Therefore it's, it doesn't exist. No, no, that's, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, um, that, that's interesting. I mean, cause the, getting back to the Franklin's met, I mean, you, you mentioned Neil Young, but somebody that your songs still have, um, again, to bring up Alan Bishop as a reference point, some of the Al Various B, I mean, in one sense, it's kind of, it's this idea, it's the singer songwriter thing, but it's bringing in these elements that you're not really going to hear. Um, you can't point to them and say, this sounds like whoever, Fred Neal or Tim Buckley, or I don't know. I don't even know what the reference points would be. Yeah, if, no, all those, you know, I was thinking about Tim Harden because we play a few Tim Harden songs. Oh, but, right, yeah. Um, but yeah, all those sort of singer songwriters, you know, uh, folk, uh, musicians are all influences or all stuff. I really, that's kind of music I'd listen to more than say, you know, some crazy <laughs> loud, loud band. Um, but yeah, Alvarius B and Alan Bishop, we've played together. But, and, you know, 
we just sunburned just to cover a sun city girl song but i could never put myself on the same you know trajectory is where he's going with his music and like, well not in terms of compare i mean I didn't, not comparing I didn't but, I, but I, I just hear like it's kind of like uh it's almost like parallel world singer songwriter in the sense that you know it doesn't sound like anything really current and doesn't sound like anything that was happening then and it's not like somebody's trying to say i'm going to be a weird singer songwriter it's just right. kind of effortlessly or not effortlessly but it doesn't sound like it's trying to be different but it sounds like that's just kind of if you sit down with a guitar and write songs it comes out a little bit a little bit different yeah i guess that's yeah just trying to like you said just sitting down with the guitar and what this is what comes out it's like this is like whether it's good or bad it's just it's true music and it's just it's not trying to I'm not trying to sound weird or yeah, or like write something and just be, you know, that, that record, that last record that you were talking about earlier is a little bit more confessional in that these elements of these things that I was going through at the time, really, you know, I just wrote them. I just wrote them out as, as I was thinking about them. Was there ever a time, I'm just kind of thinking, in, not that this was ever your goal in music, but there's a brief time when presidents of the United States are you know, selling millions of albums and you're probably at the same time playing drums with a cardboard box on your head. And did you ever um, <laughs> look at that and, and say, um, not well, that, not again, not that your goal was to sell yeah. millions of albums, but did you ever no, no. ponder well, the direction? Well, interest, <laughs> interestingly, interestingly, Chris Ballou came to see Carolina once at or Faxed Head in Seattle. And he I didn't see him at the end of the show. We didn't talk about it. So but I did invite him. He did show up, but it was definitely not his cup of tea. When Egg was playing and it was me and Chris, I'd always wanted to make records like let's make a single let's put this out and he was always like no i'm just doing this art for art's sake and he's another sort of chameleon person he gets into something he's in it all the way 100 percent, you know and next thing i know you know we wrote these songs not together he wrote he wrote all the songs but I came up with the drum parts, whatever. We had these songs. Next thing I know, he's doing the President of the United States and they're on Sony Records. And I'm like, what, 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 the, what happened? You know, he went from one extreme to this other extreme. And I don't fault him for it. And I don't feel any you know, sour grapes about it. I would never have wanted to be in the presence of the United States at that time where I was, where my head was musically. Now, I would have loved to have been in the band because <laughs> I could probably play the shit out of those songs and the paycheck would be good. But, you know, I didn't, you know, money to me is, is not, is not really an issue because to make, you know, great art, less money you have sometimes is better the art, you know, is to, to kind of be under, uh, you know, to have some sort of parameters that you can't get out of, you know, if Carolina had access to these great studios and, and, you know, Steve Albini mixing Carolina record, you know, we're not going to be the next Nirvana and it's going to probably sound like shit. It's not going to work, you know, and playing it low down. I wish I had done more stuff like that, you know, back then. Um, you didn't ask me about Barbara Manning. I was oh. in her band for a little bit. We can oh, say right. that for another time. Oh, right. another Thank band. You so much. There was a, yeah, there was another band I was in, and uh, you know, there's, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have any regrets about that. You know, as far as like, quote unquote, my career as a musician. You know, it's like I was going to be doing this, whether or not 
any of these bands got any recognition, you know? I mean, somebody asked me that years ago as an art student, you know, if would you still make art if you knew you were never going to be recognized? You know, you're never going to be in a gallery show. You're never going to, no one's ever going to see your art. And the answer was yes, of course, you know? And it's like, that's really where my true calling is, is just to be creative, you know? You could think about the stuff abstractly and like what happens after I'm gone. I'd like to think that maybe some of it will inspire somebody else 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now. But shit, you know, we might be nothing here to inspire, you know? Another year without a relapse We're not over the hill yet I wouldn't say we're young The thrill might be gone But we can find another one Happy birthday, sweetheart Try to be glad We don't drink, we don't smoke dope It's just this day we not over the hill yet I wouldn't say we're young Our vices might be few But we can 